This morning I've got some bad news and I've got some good news for you. The bad news is, after all of our study in the book of Job, we're introduced to a new character in chapter 32. And by the time he stops talking, we've covered six chapters in the scriptures. The length of these chapters in the biblical text is longer than 12 entire books of the Old Testament, longer than 17 of the 27 books of the New Testament. The good news is we're going to cover all six chapters this morning. And don't worry, I'm not going to take all day to do it. I don't mean to downplay this portion of God's Word. Uh, It is a a most interesting and, and even provocative section of the book. I think it's an important part of our study. But I fear that in this section, and and really with the book of Job as a whole, it's easy to lose the forest for the trees. There's so much said, we can lose sight of what's being communicated. We can indeed miss the point. And what I want to do today is to take a look at the high points and invite you to go back on your own time and read these chapters, chapters 32 through 37. And with that understanding as a framework, you may be able to appreciate more what is being said. We finished our last message in this series at the end of chapter 31. Uh, We had entitled that message, The Defense Rests. This was Job's final argument, defending himself. Defending himself against the accusations of his friends and really challenging God to appear, to answer, to explain himself. Why are these things happening? I can just imagine Job finishing with a flourish, in a huff, as I imagine it. He calls out, the defense rests, and he flops down in the heap of ashes there at the city dump. He's done. He's done talking. And what you see next is silence. We don't know for how long, but I want you to observe these things. Number one, Job is silent. He has said his piece and he's done. Job's friends are silent. They're appalled that Job could speak to God and about God so boldly. My guess is that if we could picture them around Job, they would slowly be backing away from him, kind of waiting for the lightning to strike and not wanting to be too close when it does. But in all of this, God remains silent. There's no fire from heaven, no voice speaking in divine wrath. God is not going to speak for a time. Now, He will. We'll get to that in our next message. But I think this does two very important things. First of all, God silences his eloquent witness to his three friends that they've got it wrong. Job is not guilty of some heinous sin for which he's about to be judged. I also think it sends a message to Job that the creator of the universe is not at the beck and call of his creatures. Just because you challenge God to come down and speak and answer doesn't mean he's bound to do it. Maybe you've heard of these atheists that will say, if there really is a God, let him strike me dead in the next five seconds. And then when five seconds elapses and they're still on their feet, they say, see, there is no God. Honestly, if God had to answer every challenge like that from his creation, I doubt there'd be time to do anything else. And at that point, who's in charge? If we can get God to do what we want, 
at our beck and call, he's no longer God. So I think that God's silence at this point speaks volumes. Now, chapter 32 in the book of Job introduces a new name. The name is Elihu. It simply means he is God. Very similar to Elijah, which means Yahweh is God. Now, we are going to see a little bit more about Elihu. He's described more fully than the other characters. And uh, it seems that he uh, comes from maybe the, the extended family of Abraham. Honestly, scholars are divided about Elihu. They're not really quite sure how to take him. Robert Shaper, in his book that I've been following on Job, uh, one of the books anyway, calls this chapter Enterprising Elihu. I'm not really sure what he means by that. Chuck Swindoll entitles his chapter on this, Another Long-Winded Monologue. <laughs> and he describes Elihu as Job's fourth friend who steps out of the shadows and talks much too long, saying far much too little. Jewish scholar Robert Gordas heads his chapter on this part of the book, Elihu the Intruder and seems to bear out this, this nickname because once he's done speaking, God never acknowledges him. Doesn't criticize him, but he doesn't endorse him either. Uh, the term that really comes to my mind heading into this study is the word enigma. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, an enigma is a person or a thing that's mysterious, puzzling, or difficult to understand. Philip Yancey has written an excellent book called Disappointment with God, and he calls, uh, calls him Enigmatic Elihu. I've chosen that as my title for this message. Another scholar agrees, writing, Elihu is rather an enigma. He blusters onto the stage as an angry young man, full of his own importance, offering to clarify the situation for Job and his friends, angry with the muddle they've gotten themselves into. He manages to spend a lot of time not saying very much. Uh, he covers much of the ground the other friends had, but supposedly saying something new. The middle speeches are a bit cold and disappointing. As he blusters away, he makes his own mistakes. But in the middle of his blustering, there are some gems. And it is these gems which are part of the preparation Job needs and we as readers need to be ready to hear the Lord. And I think that last statement gives us the real purpose of Elihu. He is sent in preparation for the Lord to speak. Now some commentators will say that these speeches were added later. After the original book of Job had been written, they were inserted at a different time. I'll leave that to the academics. It really doesn't change what is being said. And again, I think sometimes in all of those arguments, they tend to miss the point, which is what we want to look into. Some have said this is just a bit of breathing space between the end of Job's defense and God coming to speak. I think there's a little more to that. I think he does have an important role to play. And he doesn't just rehash everything that's been said before. He makes some new points that I think are very important. Things that Job and his friends had missed. Things that help us when we're going through suffering in difficult times. His insights can be valuable, although it may take some digging uh, through all of the verbiage to get to it. Now, lest somebody call me a 21st century Elihu, let's move on. If you'll open to Job 32. Job chapter 32, we are introduced to the identity of Elihu. Job 32, beginning in verse 1. So these three men stopped answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. But Elihu, son of Barakel the Buzzite of the family of Ram, became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. 
He was also angry at the three friends because they had found no way to refute Job and yet had condemned him. And now Elihu had waited before speaking to Job because they were older than he. But when he saw that the three men had nothing more to say, his anger was aroused. Now we're told more about Elihu than any of the other people. Uh, We're told about Job and his three friends, where they were from, but we're not given any family information. But with Elihu, we are. Uh, He's called the Buzzite, which would have been a descendant of a man named Buzz, who was the brother of Uz. Of course he was. A nephew of Abraham, mentioned in Genesis 22, verse 21. Ram... The family of Ram is mentioned in the genealogy of King David. And so we see here that Elihu comes out of at least the extended family of Abraham. More importantly, we find that he is a younger individual. That's why we haven't heard him yet. In those days, the etiquette stated that younger people did not speak until the older people were done. And even then, they may not be welcome to speak at all, which we'll see in a few minutes. So he had waited. He was listening. He heard all that Job had said. He heard all that the three friends had said. And we are impressed by the fact that four times in these verses, it mentions that he's angry. He is an angry young man. He wants to be heard. He feels that there's something missing in what's being said. And in fact, he's right. And some of the things that he says are sorely needed in the arguments that have been going on. Now, yes, at times he's full of himself. At times he's rash. Sometimes he talks too long. But let's not discount what he has to say because In fact, he really has some good ideas. And I'd like to highlight those ideas. While we can't go verse by verse through the whole passage, let's take an overview of what he has to say. Initially, Elihu nearly apologizes for speaking at all since he's so much younger. Look at verse 6 there in chapter 32. These are the words of Elihu. I am young in years and you are old. That is why I was fearful, not daring to tell you what I know. I thought age should speak. Advanced years should teach wisdom. But it is the spirit in a man, the breath of the Almighty, that gives him understanding. It is not only the old who are wise, not only the aged who understand what is right. You know, he has a point there. Age is no guarantee of wisdom. Some people grow wiser, and some people just grow older. (laughs) It's not one and the same. And sometimes young people have a grasp on things that is far beyond their age. And we should not dismiss what a young person says just because they're young. Paul said to Timothy, let no one despise you because of your youth. It is not the experience, it is not the education, it is not the insights of an older person that gives wisdom. What Elihu points to here is it is the Spirit of God who gives wisdom. And understand the where he says the Spirit in a man, the breath of the Almighty. In Hebrew it's the same word. Breath and spirit are the same word. It's a bit of parallelism here. It is not just the human spirit. It is the divine spirit. It is when God's spirit teaches us. It is when God's spirit speaks to us that we have wisdom. And what Elihu is saying is when the spirit of the Lord speaks, don't get too caught up in the vessel that brings the message. Elihu 
communicates some excellent points in these, this initial speech that covers chapters 32 and 33. First, he says, God disciplines a person in order to turn him from the error of his way. So far in the arguments back and forth, all the three friends can say is, Job, you've sinned, God is punishing you, and you deserve everything you get. Now there's a difference between punishment and discipline. Oftentimes in in our culture, we tend to blur those two. But a punishment is simply an acknowledgement that something is done wrong, and the punishment is to correct it, to make it right, to satisfy justice. Discipline, on the other hand, has a teaching element in it. There is a lesson to be learned. When justice is done, there's really no concern if a lesson is to be learned unless it's by those who are observing, those who are watching. Let this be a lesson to you so that you don't go down the same path. With discipline, there is a lesson for the person being disciplined. And Elihu says, when you are suffering, don't just look at it that God is mad at you and that God is judging you. Look to see, what can I learn from this? Is there a lesson? Is God trying to communicate to me to make me a better person? Punishment in and of itself does not make a better person. Discipline can. So Elihu says, God disciplines those who he wants to Bring to himself. He wants to better them. Secondly, God governs justly. He is fair. He is sovereign. These are two things you see throughout Elihu's speeches. God's justice, his sovereignty. He is not only good all the time, he is sovereign all the time. He's always in control. And being God, he doesn't always feel obligated to explain himself. Job has been demanding answers. He's been demanding explanations. God, why are you doing this? And God doesn't have to answer. Why? Because he's God and you're not. He is the creator. We are the creation. We don't tell God what to do. And he is not obligated to respond when we do. Now, another important insight you gain here, and he develops it later on as well, is there is a real purpose in suffering. See, not only does God send suffering because someone has sinned, sometimes he sends suffering to keep us from sin. Sometimes the difficulties of life, the challenges of life, are to keep us from getting into trouble, not just because we have committed some sin. Case in point would be in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul How many of you have heard of the thorn in the flesh that Paul dealt with? Familiar phrase. It is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And when you read that passage, you discover God did not give that thorn in the flesh because Paul had sinned. He gave it to him so that Paul would not sin. In the explanation, Paul says in order to keep me from becoming conceited, God permitted this thorn in the flesh in my life. Paul had not sinned. Paul had not become conceited. But in order to keep him from becoming conceited, God sent this thorn in the flesh. Again, a new angle. A new perspective on suffering. It's not always evil. 
Sometimes it can be for our good. Now this is very different from what you're going to hear on television. TV preachers will say that all pain, all suffering, all sickness is of the devil. It's never God's will that his children be sick or in any kind of of difficult situation. That is simply not true. It is not biblical. And one of the points Elihu makes is that pain and suffering can sometimes be beneficial to the child of God. In his book, The Problem of Pain, C.S. Lewis writes, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. How many times do we go through life and everything's going well, things are just going right according to plan, we're having a great time enjoying it, and we lose touch with God. We get so busy in the things that are going well in our lives, we don't have time for God. We don't have time to pray. We don't have time for His Word. We don't have time to worship in His house. And sometimes God realizes that the only way to get us to look up is to put us flat on our back. David said in the Psalms, I am thankful for the affliction that brought me back to God. And it can work to our benefit. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 to 11 speak of that. Pain is not always negative in its outcome. It can actually bring us closer to the Lord. In the second speech of Elihu in in chapter 34, uh, he kind of sounds a little bit like his friends. Oh, it's, it's a little disappointing, to be honest, after his, his beginning uh, offering. But he does show some consideration for Job that's missing in the others. He's not trying to embarrass Job. He doesn't list a whole bunch of supposed sins that Job has committed. He's just saying, Job, <laughs> there's something wrong here. Maybe you should be paying attention. In this second speech, Elihu focuses on the central issue of the justice of God. Is God fair? Up until now, Job has been saying, no, he's not. None of this is fair. None of this is right. And he really almost calls into question. Now, he doesn't curse God. He never sins in blaming God, but but he questions the justice of God. And Elihu says very emphatically, no, God is just. Now, he does so in these middle chapters with a lot of intensity. And sometimes that intensity can be mistaken for cruelty or insensitivity. But what you see here is really, in Elihu, a zeal for God and a zeal for God's reputation. He is not promoting himself here. He is really defending God. Now, you can argue that God doesn't need to be defended. You would have a point. But I don't think that Elihu is being cruel as some of the scholars tend to uh, paint him as, uh, I think he is just so intense about his belief in God. And and we need to be careful sometimes. As, As we talk to people about the Lord, we can get very emotional. Emotions aren't bad. Just make sure they're under control so that we don't go too far in, in speaking about the Lord, that, that we can uh, unintentionally even turn people away. Really, Elihu is right about the justice and the goodness of God. Um, it's just the way he goes about it, yeah, maybe it could have been better. His third speech, uh, recorded in chapter 35, Elihu deals with the thorny issue of unanswered prayer. We sang about that in our communion hymn. Teach me the patience of unanswered prayer. Job was complaining because God's not answering my prayers. I've been calling out to God and nothing. It's just like my prayers bounce off the ceiling and right back down to the ground. 
Now, what Elihu does, he points out some reasons why prayers are not answered. In chapter 5, 35, I mean, uh, verse 12, he points out pride can be a hindrance to prayer. Verse 13, wrong motives. In verse 14, a lack of faith. Now, you go into the New Testament and you'll find corollaries to each one of these. James talks about you... You ask, uh, you, you don't have because you don't ask, and when you do ask, you ask with wrong motives that you may uh, indulge your sinful pleasures. And that's why sometimes prayer is not answered. Uh, there are times when Jesus uh, would not display his divine power because of a lack of faith. Sometimes we don't believe, and that's why our prayers are not answered. Sometimes it's pride and other sin that gets in the way. All of these things are true. What we've got to be careful of is that we don't use them as pat answers, which is exactly what the three friends did. Oh, your prayers aren't being answered. Well, you must be full of pride. You must be asking with wrong motives. You must not have enough faith. I mean, those are just the the pat answers people give. Let me ask you, did any of those apply to Job? No. None of them did. And there are times in our lives where there are other reasons why God doesn't answer prayer. These are three possibilities. Might not be a bad thing to check them off if our prayers aren't being answered. Lord, is there some sin in my life? Am I asking for the wrong reasons? Do I have a lack of faith that you're going to answer? Okay, check that out. But those aren't the only reasons. We've got to be very careful that we don't fall into the trap of the three friends and think these are the only reasons why, and so it's got to be one of these. Something's wrong with you, Job. No, there was another reason. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers as quickly as we would like because he is teaching us. Sometimes he doesn't answer as quickly as we would like because he is doing something else in somebody else's life and that must take place first before our prayer can be answered. There are an abundant reasons why God may not answer our prayers the way we want and when we want. Again, let God be God. We've got to be very careful that we don't put God in a box that we don't make God manageable and predictable. Because when God is manageable and predictable, he becomes able to be manipulated. When we think God is a formula, that if I say the right things and I do the right things, now this is going to happen every single time. No, it doesn't. God is not bound to our ideas of what he ought to do. And that's something that they've wrestled with now for over 30 chapters in the book of Job. God is sovereign. He is in control. He is not someone we can fully comprehend. He is not somebody that we can predict or even manage. He is God. Divine wisdom is not merely something we get if we think hard enough, if we believe well enough, or if our theological system is coherent, tidy, and clear. As we're going to see, when God does come on the scene, He comes on the scene in a storm, in a whirlwind. His power cannot be contained. And Almighty God cannot be manipulated. C.S. Lewis makes this great point uh, in his children's series, The Chronicles of Narnia. How many of you ever at least heard of them, maybe read them? The very first book is called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. If you haven't read them, I, I would recommend it. They're, they're wonderful stories that really communicate biblical truth. And one of his main characters is Aslan the Lion, and he is the Christ figure throughout this series of books. 
Mr. Beaver is explaining to these four children who've come from Earth to Narnia about Aslan. And he says this, He'll be coming and going. One day you'll see him, and the next day you won't. He doesn't like being tied down, and of course he has other countries to attend to. It's quite all right. He'll often drop in. Only you mustn't press him. He's wild, you know. He's not a tame lion. Let that sink in for a moment. Our God is not a tame lion. Our God has not been domesticated. Our God is not under our control. That's Almighty God. That's the God of the whirlwind that we're going to see next Sunday. That is the God who created the universe, who sustains the universe. That is our God. We cannot put him in a box. We cannot put him in a cage. We cannot train him to do what we want. Thank goodness. God is God. And that's really the greatest thing Elihu does in these chapters. Especially in his fourth speech, chapters 36 and 37. He seems to rise above all the petty notions of Job's friends and even of Job in some points. This is the highlight of what he has to say. In Job 36... He speaks of God. He he presents here a theology that is very sound. In verse 15, he says, Those who suffer, he delivers in their suffering. He speaks in their affliction. Job's friends up till now have been saying, God is so great, he can't be concerned with little old you, Job. What you say and do doesn't matter to him because he's... Almighty God, He's so great. He has so much He has to be concerned with. How can He be concerned with you? Elihu says, no, God speaks to the suffering. God cares. He is there. He is right there with you. He's not so far removed. How many of you as a child learned that that, uh, prayer, usually say before meal, God is great. God is good, right? A lot of people get to this matter of suffering and they say, well, God's either not as great as we think He is or He's not as good as we think He is. The fact is, He is both. God is great and God is good. But what He is not is predictable. What He is not is able to be manipulated to our ends. Our prayer is, your will be done on earth, not my will be done in heaven. And a lot of people have that idea of God, that if I have faith, if I have enough faith, I can tell God what I want and He's got to do it. No, that's not faith. That's presumption. Having faith in God is, I don't understand what you're doing or why you're doing it, but I do believe it's right. I do believe in the end it will be the best. And what we see here in chapter 36 is, is again, an angle that we just haven't seen until now, and that is that pain can have a benefit in our lives. There is what author Martin Israel calls the pain that heals. In it he writes, It is one of the fundamental contributions of pain to make people wake up to a deeper quality of existence and to seek evidence for meaning in their lives beyond the immediate sensations that arrest their attention. What's he saying there? We can get so caught up in our day-to-day existence and the things that we're doing and what's right now that we lose the big picture. And sometimes it takes pain to slow us down, maybe to bring us to a screeching halt. 
and wake us up. Remember what Lewis said? Pain is the megaphone God uses to rouse a deaf world. Sometimes he uses it to get our attention. Sometimes that's the only way we will look up. And that's the emphasis of chapter 37. Elihu looks up. And as you read through those verses, you see a beautiful picture of Almighty God. His great power, His magnificence, written across this chapter could be the words, It's all about God. The flip side of the opening phrase of the book, Purpose Driven Life, It's not about you. (laughs) It's all about God. And if nothing else, Elihu brings to the conversation, this is important. He says to Job, and he says to Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, Guys, you're only looking around, you're only looking within, you're only looking back, look up! We saw last week in Job's defense, he looked back. In his past, he looked around at his present. He looked within. Those are all good things, but the one thing he hadn't done yet is look up. And Elihu says, look up. That's where you're going to find answers. That's where you're going to find hope. As George Sweeting used to say, if the outlook is dark, try the up look. (laughs) And this is where we get to the importance of Elihu. Almost every commentary is skeptical about him, critical of his views, his tone, his character. I think they've missed the point. I really believe that Elihu serves the purpose in Job that John the Baptist served in the time before Jesus. He came to prepare the way. I think Elihu gets our perspective where it needs to be so that when God comes, we're ready to hear from him. Job wasn't so introspective that he would miss what God had to say. Elihu gets our perspective to be heavenly. And when we are in pain, and when we are suffering, when we are going through difficult times, that is the biggest challenge. We become so tunnel visioned into what's happening right now, what's happening to me, my little situation. That's all we see. That's all we hear. We need to take the blinders off and we need to see God. We need to Give God the kind of respect he is due. Elihu has gone on and on and on about God's justice, about his sovereignty, but he also balances that with God's mercy and his grace. Elihu brings us a balanced view of God that we really haven't seen yet. And he gets our eyes off of ourselves and where they need to be. Job would say later in Job 42.5, speaking to God, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. I think he could say that because Elihu had prepared him for God's entrance. Sometimes God will use individuals that way in our lives too. We may be going through some difficult times. We may wonder, God, what are you doing? Are you doing anything? What's happening here? And some Christian brother or sister may come along and get our perspective where he needs to be. And it might not be the kind of person you'd expect. It may not be the preacher. It may not be those older saints who have been experienced so much. It might be a young person. Don't dismiss it just because of their youth. God spoke through a donkey. Didn't diminish what he had to say. I'm not likening young people to donkeys, by the way, so don't hate me. 
What I'm saying is God can use any vessel to speak. Here he used a younger man to get their eyes where they needed to be. I think Elihu is a bridge in the book of Job, stretching from the inadequate theology of a detached God, a God who is great, but is so far away he can't really be bothered by your problems. Or a God who is all about wrath, and he just sits in heaven looking for somebody to zap. Yes, we serve a God who is holy. We serve a God who is just. We serve a God who is great. But we also serve a God who is good. He is loving. He is gracious. He is merciful. We need a complete picture of God. And we need a picture of God that is accurate. He is God. He is beyond our comprehension. He is beyond our power to manipulate. He will do what He will do. Whether we agree with it, whether we understand it or not. And that is what faith is. Faith isn't saying, I know God's going to do what I want. Faith is saying, God's going to do what He wants and I'm going to accept it. And that's what Elihu brings us to. Yes, Elihu is an enigma. He's a bit of a mystery. Much like the God he prepared Job to hear. And like John the Baptist centuries later, Elihu prepared the way for God to appear and to speak. Are we in a place where we can hear God speak. As we close, I'd like you to turn in your hymnal, hymn number 155. Hymn number 155. We've talked a lot about perspective and vision this morning. For many of us, what we need is the chorus of this verse, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. What happens? The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. This is what Job needed. This is what Job's friends needed. This may very well be what we need. To turn our eyes upon Jesus and everything will fall into place.